Divine Truth Documentary Jesus, Mary and Others provide information to people or organizations that produce documentaries. In this video, Jesus and Mary are interviewed by Thomas Lira while at the local beach. This is session 10, filmed on the 15th of August 2013 in Maluluba, Queensland, Australia. Yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. Only so it's a complete this point. Um, and okay, so okay. Um, can you tell me about the predictions you have for the short-term future? Um, you call them predictions. I call them personal opinions. <laughs> I don't feel they are predictions. I feel that uh, I have certain personal feelings about what might happen in the future to the Earth and and reasons why those particular things might happen to the earth. I wouldn't call them predictions in the sense that I don't, they're not a prophecy or a pr prediction of the future. And also, obviously, if I'm not at one with God, which I've said quite categorically that I'm not, it's difficult to make predictions of the future uh, without having some kind of connection to God, because it's only God really that knows the future properly. So. For me, they're just feelings about uh, my and personal opinions about what I feel the future holds for humankind if we make some continue to make the same choices we make. So, if we continue to make the same choices we're currently making, my feelings about the future are there's going to be some fairly major events that affect the Earth, and also these events are cyclical in their nature. In other words, over the last 120,000 years or so, there's been seven cycles of these kind of events where tectonic plates move suddenly and uh, all of a sudden all around the earth there's major changes in the way in which the earth uh, is structured and, uh, and therefore major changes to the land masses of the earth and I feel those particular events are probably going to happen fairly shortly, that's my personal opinion. I'm not, I don't feel it's God's truth because uh, I, I don't know for certain what, what, the, what the future holds. But I do feel there are a number of reasons why I feel these feelings quite strongly. And one of them is that these are cyclical events, firstly, and we've not had such a cyclical event for the same period that most of the cyclical events have happened in the past. So for nearly 16,000 years we haven't had a similar event, and as a result we are due for a similar event already. And then secondly, humankind hasn't treated the earth very well at this point and in fact continues to harm the earth itself and uh, and continues to take from it without living in harmony with it in terms of it, our long-term future is even in jeopardy and and I feel that while this remains while our attitude towards the earth remains to be so then the earth will go through correcting influences as all of things in nature correct thing, uh, have corrective influences. And so I believe quite strongly at this point that there will be future events that occur that will affect the Earth, and I still believe that. So, um, but I wouldn't call them predictions or prophecies. They're just my personal opinions. And uh, Mary feels quite differently. So, um, and we're from the same soul, so there has to be reasons why Mary feels quite differently. And I, my, uh, my feelings about future events haven't been very accurate <laughs> so far. So, you know, I don't have a strong feeling that they are definitely accurate. I just feel that the laws involved that I know about how God creates things and, and how humankind living in fear affect things on the planet, uh, there's a strong feeling that I have that these events are still going to occur. So now people then take that out of context. So pretty much every time I've ever discussed anything to do with changes that may happen to the earth itself, everyone has pretty much taken them out those those discussions out of context. What they've done is they've they've taken away my preamble, the you know the preface of it's my personal opinion, and they've tried to somehow indicate that it's some kind of prophecy or prediction. 
and uh, I can't agree with that. There's, I'm not making prophecies of what will happen in the future, and I can't make accurate prophecies until I'm at one with God. And even then, once you're at one with God, you still don't know everything God knows. So you, it's a constantly growing relationship between yourself and God. And this is why even once I become at one with God, if someone asks me my personal opinion about something in the future, I still might not know the truth of it. Because even when you're at one with God, you still don't know all of God's truth. As I've explained in previous answers, it's impossible to know all of God's truth, in fact. Given the fact that God's an infinite being with an infinite universe, and I'm a finite being growing towards God, it's impossible for me to know everything. So this expectation that Jesus knows everything and the expectation that Jesus is not allowed to have a personal opinion is, I feel, quite flawed on a number of logical levels. So I, I believe still that these events will occur. I may be wrong. That's not important to me whether they occur or not because I have other important things, more important things to uh, concern myself about, including our personal development, uh, getting into that condition of atonement with God and also then being able to give an example of what being at one with God in love means to people on the planet. To me that's far more important than anything that happens to the earth itself. So, so when people focus on that, if uh, I feel they're taking a lot of the things I've said way out of context, but also they're focusing on their fears. In, in terms of how many times I've spoken about so-called earth change events, every time I've been questioned about them in advance. Secondly, um, if you look at the thousand hours or so of presentations that I've given on YouTube, around 10 to 15 hours of it are responding to people's questions about earth change events. So in terms of percentage, it's not a very high percentage of anything. So, And also, thirdly, um, it is my personal opinion, and so I don't really like spending too much time on it. But I do wish to confront people's fears as to uh, these kind of events. Because I do feel that if we were in tune with the Earth more, we would know beforehand what was going to happen on the Earth and where it was going to happen. And therefore many thousands, if not millions of lives could be saved if we know in advance what is going to happen. And so I have a, an interest in knowing in advance what may happen to the earth because I feel that many millions of lives can be saved if people listen to what might happen in advance. And we've got two options. One is that we change our behaviour so that those things don't happen. And the second option is if they finish up happening because we don't change our behaviour, at least we can save a lot of people in the process so more people can survive the cataclysmic events that might happen. So that's the main reason why I discuss it with people. In addition, I discuss it to try and confront some of their fears. It like, looks like we've got a dog coming to join us. So, you see how that goes. Ah. Oh. Oh. You just got an insight into Simon's world. <laughs> oh. I don't even talk to you about that. Okay. Yeah, can I also mention that uh, the main reason why people ask questions about the future is because they're afraid of the future, generally. It's not like they're looking forward to the future, they're generally afraid. And, and I don't have any fears about the future. Even if I die, I don't have any fears about the future. So I'm very confident of what will happen even if I pass. And so I'm not worried about the future. So my feelings about events on the earth are not tainted by my avoidance of fear. Whereas the average person living on the planet, that when they contemplate the future, a lot of their feelings are tainted by the avoidance of fear. They, and so they become, obviously by avoiding fear, they become focused on what they can do to prevent their fear. And this is one reason why most people are driven to ask questions about the future. From God's perspective, we don't need to worry about the future. God's got a perfect universe, and no matter what happens to us, we'll still be alive. And so there's no real need to worry about the future. There's no, there's no great day of God the Almighty, as the Bible says, Armageddon, that will come to the earth and destroy the wicked and and keep the righteous and then we've got to work out the definition of who's wicked and who's righteous and so forth. None of those kind of events will occur in our future. So there is often a statement in the media that we are some kind of doomsday cult leaders and we don't even believe in a doomsday. So um, I can't see how uh, we are then a cult leader that, <laughs> that believes in a doomsday type of event. 
we do feel, uh, or I should say specifically, I do feel that events that happen in the future are going to be the direct results of mankind's choices most of the time. And uh, and we have a lot of choices. We could, you know, if you look at our the way in which we investigate things on Earth, if we spent all of the money that we spent on war investigating how the Earth operates and works, then I'm pretty sure that we could almost prevent any loss of life from any natural event if we spent the same amount of money that we spent on war on those on discovering more about those natural events. The problem is man has a definite focus on war, unfortunately, rather than those natural events, and so we spend all of our money making new weapons of war rather than finding out about our environment, how we're impacting our environment, what kind of danger we're in by impacting our environment and so forth, which I feel are much more important questions for humanity to resolve. So I feel quite strongly that if we focused on those issues, we would know in advance the Earth would give us warnings of any events that may occur and we'd be very, very safe from those particular events occurring in terms of even if they did occur, there would be very little or no loss of life as a result of them. So that's where I'm focused with regard to these kind of events. But when someone asks my, me my personal opinion, I'm pretty happy to give it. And uh, if they refuse to take the if that I put in front of it, like this is my personal opinion, <laughs> uh, rather than God's truth, then my suggestion is, well, they just need to listen to my answer more carefully and remember the, the first bit that I stated as well as the last bit. That's my feelings about those kind of events and what I'm reported to have been have said. And what I'm also what I have said in my comments in my seminars. Every single discussion I have generally prefaced with, this is my personal opinion. It's not God's truth. God's truth is different to my personal opinion. There was a first human couple on Earth. Uh, their names weren't Adam and Eve. That were the names that were, they were given from the Bible account. But their names, as they are now, their names are Ammon and a man. And uh, you could translate to be the first I am, uh, male I am, and the first female I am, basically, or the first human couple that were self-aware. The first people that were self-aware. They are in the spirit world now, so we've met them and discussed things with them about what they remember about the inception of the human race. And they don't remember having a childhood at all. They, they don't have any recollection of a childhood, so they don't know how their bodies were created, really. They can make suppositions, but they don't know. But their bodies were created by something, some process, they don't, which they don't understand at this point because they weren't there. And then their soul, their soul that God created, was connected, God connected them to the two bodies, and they remember from that moment onwards. They remember everything that happened to them on earth, and then everything that happened to them since in the spirit world. They remember the choices they made on earth, the reason for the devolution of man, because man devolved before he evolved, and they remember those events and why that occurred. They know the answers to why that occurred, because I've observed all of those answers from a personal experience. So they're very interesting people to talk to, and my suggestion to anyone who passes is to look them up, you know, ask them to come and talk to you about what's actually happened. They are people who are uh, very well developed now in the spirit world, and so they're pretty happy to address large groups of people on these kind of subjects. And uh, any person who's willing to ask them the truth about the creation of humanity, they can tell you from their own personal experience what it felt like and they can also tell you what happened in their life of what they remember as far back as they can remember. But they can't go beyond that point without making presumptions or suppositions. And I suppose one of the important things to understand about um, when we refer to humankind or the first human couple is that um, we see God's creation of the human soul and it being attached to a physical body as that's what makes us human, the, the ability to be self-aware, the ability to be conscious of our will 
and to grow. And so when people ask us sometimes about evolution and did humanity come from apes and all of these things, and while we might have our personal opinion about that, um, really the main thing to be aware of is that we consider a human as someone with a human soul attached to them. Does that make sense? So the real you is not your body, your spirit body, but the real you is the soul that God created. And how the body came into existence, we have certain feelings about, and we feel pretty certain about those particular feelings, but but we may not be correct yet in terms of, because we there was nobody present watching it all, actually from the unfolding from the start. However, if you want to ask questions about, you know, how the first human couple's bodies were created, well, we feel they were created, not, not slowly evolved over thousands or millions of years. We do know that the human race, from, from the people who have watched this occur, we do know that the human race devolved uh, right down to where the human race was very, very small and, uh, and lived very, very short lifetimes as a result of their condition, their love-based condition. And then they evolved uh, from that poor condition as they grew in love they evolved and improved their condition. We know that for certain because we've discussed that with the people involved. Um, but we don't know for certain how the first human couple arrived on the planet because nobody can answer that from personal experience. So all we can do is make suppositions about how that occurred. But at this point in time, we can make fairly strong suppositions based on what we've observed. And and that the suppositions we believe at this point in time is that God created the human bodies and the spirit body at the time of the inception of the soul. Uh, but, but there is no um, way of verifying that information because nobody was present at the time aside from God who actually went and, went and did that. There's no one present at the time, so there's no one you could actually say, you know, have you traced the existence back beyond this point? So that's the thing, key thing to, I feel to remember about the first human couple. They are still alive in the spirit world. You can speak to them, you can ask them questions, but they can only go back to a certain point. They can't go beyond that point from their personal experience. Uh, once they hit that point, there's, from then on, everything's about what they've worked out through, through experiments and other things, rather than what they know for certain through their personal experience. So I guess I want to talk about homes, the homes, that, the people that moved um, to be closer to you, um, and the way that the way that um, they were looking for you to be some type of cult leader, and <laughs> pushed up the, the prices of the properties in the area. Right. Oh, yes. And um, yes, people did decide uh, after I lived in my current home for nearly probably four years. Yeah. Uh, some people started moving to be near us where we lived. Of course, we decided to live where we were because we wanted some privacy. <laughs> so um, when they come to the day moving near us, we, Mary in particular wasn't that necessarily happy with their choices, but of course they have free will and they can make some choices of whatever they want to do. And of course they never discuss their choices with us. So, you know, and, and we don't feel any need to control anybody's choices, even if someone comes and licks next door to us, that's their choice, you know, at the end of the day. We feel that many of them did that out of fear, and we feel that many of them did that um, to, to feel like they're a part of something. Myself and Mary's focus is worldwide, so we're not interested in developing some kind of little enclave in some location. We're interested in sharing divine truth, God's truth, worldwide. So it, it, that means that we're not going to be home very often, <laughs> generally. And uh, that means that anybody who's come to live near us, expecting to see more of us, has been quite disappointed, in fact. Um, so while they, a few of them may have moved to the location for certain reasons, now many of them, some of them are now moving back out of the location, back to other places that more are based on their interests. And also some of them have been a little disappointed that we're not spending more time with them. And I suppose that is an indication of how much people do sometimes want somebody to tell them what to do and to lead them and be involved, be involved in their day-to-day in their, their day -day life. And Mary and I are not like that, as you are aware. We don't have lots of people involved in our day-to-day -day life. We're very private people and we enjoy our own privacy. We share God's truth with others because we love doing that. But we also enjoy our 
private moments and, uh, and our private life. And so we're not looking for lots of people to come to stay with us. There is no compound. There is no, you know, group community living or something like that. Although some people around us have tried to create such things. Um, often against our recommendations, actually, because we feel that people need to follow their own course in life and discover through their own passions and desires what they want to do for the rest of their life. And that requires living in a, with a worldwide view, not with a, not with a specific location in view. So there were times in the last six or seven years where people bought some properties and, uh, and I was happy to see them buy a property if that property was going to be used in harmony with love. But unfortunately, the property finished up not, not being used in harmony with love and we weren't consulted about how it was used and many times other people came to live there. And in one case, one property, there was about 25 or 30 people living on the property. And, uh, and then they asked us, what should we do? And we said, all of you leave the property <laughs> because we felt that they were, they were harming the land and they needed to first learn how to care for land before they move onto a property that's got some nice pristine bush on it and rather than clearing that and destroying that. So, so often our advice has been completely opposite to what is portrayed in the media as to our advice is. Of course, we don't own those properties, so it's not up to us to govern them or look after them or care for them or any um, of those things. We don't expect to be consulted on how people, what, how they make their decisions, yeah. you know. Um, but when people do ask us, we freely give our opinion, especially when we can see that some harm is being done, not just to the individuals themselves, but to the environment that they're living on. Yeah. Um, but certainly we don't believe in the idea of living separately from society. We believe very strongly that um, that everyone is our brother and sister and if we think that we're going to be able to attain a better society by being separate from society we're already living in a lot of judgment and fear and those things don't assist the world to become a better place. What changes the world is people who love living in the world and showing people how to love not living as separate to the world in some kind of compound or some kind of you know special unique circumstances that the average person can't even replicate let alone follow that's never going to change the world. So we believe that these sort of, these, there are cults on the planet who do do all of that, who have compounds and have, you know, enclaves where they, where all of their supporters live and so forth. But we don't personally agree with such things and we don't encourage such things. We do encourage people um, having property, who own property, to look after the property and care for it and, and love it and care for every creature on it. And, and we're sometimes, or fre frequently at times, ask for advice about how to do that. So we freely give that advice, but we don't feel that, well, actually what we would like to see is that the whole world is eventually like that. Like that every person who owns any property cares for the property, cares for the, for the creatures on the property, makes sure that it's self-sustainable eventually, and works towards that goal. Because we feel if, if everyone on earth does that, then we, we have a sustainable future if that occurs. So that's what we'd love to see happen when it comes to the way people use land. But we're not uh, focused on, you know, trying to maintain some kind of, uh, you know, special compounds all over the planet or anything like that. We have no interest in doing that. We have enough trouble looking after our own 40 acres, let alone <laughs> <laughs> looking after anything more than that. But we do expect at some time in the future to have um, the ability to go anywhere on the world and stay there and enjoy the company of other people who, who are there looking after their land and whether their belief systems are different to theirs I don't think it's going to matter very much as long as everybody learns how to love I think if, if that's the common belief system I'd be very pleased and, and we do have friends people who or people that we know who have decided that they would like to dedicate their land to become centres of learning yeah. about divine truth and divine truth in action and practical application. And in the future, I believe they would like to have their properties open for people to visit and see examples of what mm. what's possible when we implement um, environmental projects, education projects, in harmony with God's laws. And uh, that's very exciting. But 
while we sometimes provide advice to people who are wanting to undertake those projects, we certainly don't control them or own them or have anything to do with them in a day-to-day uh, yeah. basis. And we only provide advice when we're asked. So we don't provide advice even if we think things are not going well on their property. We won't tell them that until they ask. So we don't feel we have the right to tell them anything unless they ask. Mm. So there's been people who have asked and so we've given them that feedback. And then there's others who have decided they want to do some kind of, you know, example of divine truth and we feel they're making a terrible mess of it. <laughs> they never ask and so we never tell them that. <laughs> so it just depends on, uh, on what, what occurs in terms of, you know, their, their openness to the principles really. Because everything we teach is provided for free and in the public domain, people can do what they will with it and sometimes people take elements of it and claim it as their own and produce materials, teaching materials with it. And uh, claim it as their and own. And claim it as their <laughs> own. Sometimes people set up centres that they state are examples of divine truth. And, and we think they are totally the opposite of what divine truth represents. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just something that happens when you do everything for free and put it in the public domain. And we don't really have any strong feelings about that, negative feelings about that, because we feel no. God's truth has its own power. And in the end, it it'll be clear who's working in harmony with love and who's not. And, you know, there's people on Facebook claiming to be us and there's people on Twitter claiming to be us and, you know, they're all deceitful people who are claim, falsely claiming to be us. That's up to them, you know, if they want to do that and be deceitful. Their own soul is the thing that's going to be detrimentally affected by such decisions. We don't feel any need to go around trying to punish them for such actions or, or police, those, or police them. Kind of thing. So, you know, that's all up to them. They, if they want to take actions that are unethical, then that's their decision. And we don't feel responsible for their decisions, but, uh, but we also don't feel like we want to correct their decisions if that's what they wish to do. That's how strongly we believe in free will, in, in God's gift of allowing each individual on the planet to decide to do what they want, even if what they want is out of harmony with love. that if children pass, then they're kind of looked after in the spirit world. Yep. Yeah, God's made a beautiful system in the spirit world where any child who passes, uh, independent of the injuries that they've received from parents or others in their environment, when they pass, they end up in a place where it was called Summerland, that uh, spirits who are in very loving condition look after them and educate them. And so any child that passes, parents on earth do not need to worry about what's happening to their child after they pass because they are really well looked after in the spirit world. The only time that that can't happen is when the parent on earth grieves too much and they hold on to their child through their grief. When this happens, the child keeps returning back to the parent on earth and so therefore cannot fully experience their life in the spirit world. So I would recommend the parents that they address their grief when their children die and allow themselves to fully grieve it and understand that, that they're very well cared for in the spirit world. Perhaps we can explain that a little more about the parents. Um, so if a parent is actually gets caught in the grief process and so they don't allow the full sadness, because when we really fully grieve we, we allow our sadness, we might cry a lot, but we reach a place of being able to let go. and. And it's wonderful knowing that God has made these beautiful provisions for children in the spirit world because then we can also let go knowing that they're in a place where they're cared for. and You'll see them again. Someone has a well, their well, best welfare in mind and that you'll be able to see them again. Mm. Where a lot of parents get stuck in their grief is when they feel they just can't let them go, they just can't get beyond the fact that this child is no longer here on earth. And they, what happens is from an, a soul perspective or an emotional perspective is that they are constantly projecting this feeling at the child, please don't leave me, don't have left me. And so the child in the spirit world actually can feel that and is drawn back to the earth, which is like preventing them from moving on with their own life and developing and growing as a person. Plus, if you imagine they're living in the best possible place you could ever live on in earth, 
and then wherever their parents are, whenever their parents hold on to their grief, they're drawn back to that location and it doesn't feel good for them to have to come back to that location but they feel like they have to because of the connection they have with their parents and, and so if parents could allow themselves to work through the issue, the child is free to explore the spirit world and often they will explore so much of the spirit world that by the time the parent arrives in the spirit world, the child would be able to educate them about all <laughs> sorts of things in the spirit world that the parent wouldn't have the opportunity to learn very rapidly themselves. And so it actually, it's actually to the, both the parent and child's benefit that the child is let, able to explore the spirit world without this constant returning to earth all the time and constant returning to make the parent's emotions better. Um, if the parents can own their emotions better, feel them, experience them, release them from their, themselves, then move on with their lives, always remembering that they, their child can be with them any time. The child is probably, often when they think about their child, the child would be with them at that moment anyway. And they, they still have a relationship when they go to sleep as well. So every night they go to sleep, they probably catch up with their child. And so there's all of that stuff that's still happening. And if the average parent realised that, then I'm sure they would not have as much grief about the death or the pre the unnatural, let's call it, death of their own child. Yeah. Thank you. Editing Thank you. <laughs> Good to catch up with you, mate. Thank you very much. Take care.